try this greeting again. That's better when I remember the microphone to bring it up. I, I guess I'm still on vacation? I don't know. But you would have seen the panic in my face as I stood there bowing during the bell ringing and went, ooh, I forgot the microphone. <laughs> Good to see you this morning. Welcome to worship. Glad to have you all at home joining us as well as we gather, as always, to receive God's gifts and his blessings. We'll begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I invite you to take a moment in silence as you reflect on your own sins and your need for Jesus' forgiveness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated.
Please rise. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together. O Lord, you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance. Give us pure hearts and minds to follow your Son faithfully, even into suffering and death. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We confess our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, just a lot of reminders this week again about the 25th and our one worship service and welcoming Vicar Josh um, to our staff. In particular today, I wanted to highlight the need for desserts for Camp Lone Star's barbecue. Um, expecting probably a pretty good turnout for them this year, especially since they weren't able to have that event last year. So if you can bake something or, or provide a dessert of some kind for them that day, um, and just drop it off here in the kitchen before 9 o'clock on the 25th, um, that would be greatly appreciated. And then just, oh, 9.15, 9.15 would be good to have it here. Um, and that is right before our worship service, so that would be, that would be great. Um, also, just a reminder, Dorcas Circle is not meeting this month. That would be this Tuesday, so if that involves you or you are planning to go this month, just know that they are not meeting this month. And I think that's it. Thank you, Katie, for those announcements. We'll continue with our offering. Reminders you can give online. Of course, the offering plates are in back. All as we continue to respond to good, God's goodness uh, and what he has given us. And we'll continue with our offering Him. Let the vineyards be fruitful. Let's rise as we go to God in prayer. God of grace and mercy, we pray that you would uh, accept these offerings as we respond to the uh, many gracious gifts that you've bestowed on us in our daily life. Lord, we pray that you take these offerings and you would use them to further your kingdom in this time and place as we, uh, as we disciple one another, as we grow in courage and faith, and as we reach out to transform this community with your love, sharing your good news with all those that we encounter. Lord, we pray today that you be with many that we have uh, on our hearts and minds. And we pray that you would bring health and healing to those that are sick. Uh, that you would, uh, we give you thanks for the, the doctors, the nurses, all the medical professionals, the therapists, those providing care. We ask you to continue to bless these that we name. We pray for Clyde Schneider, Leila Yonda, Glenda Paskett, 
Curtis Urban and James Arndt. And Lord, we ask you to begin to continue to watch them and strengthen them, be with their families. Lord, we rejoice in your many blessings today. We give thanks for anniversaries as we uh, celebrate with Larry and Debbie Blankenberg and Robert and Janice Dramer. We thank you for, their, uh, for those families and we pray your continued blessings for them. Uh, for those celebrating birthdays today, we rejoice with Glenda Paskett, Josh Menke, Ellen Schneider, Paul Fisher, and Stephanie Menach as they celebrate birthdays. Uh, Lord, we lift up to the National Lutheran Youth Workers Conference in Houston uh, that are beginning this week, and we pray your blessings on those who gather as they uh, continue to seek ways to serve the youth um, in, our, in our communities and ask you to bless all of their efforts. For our ministry prayers, we lift up today, uh, and we give you thanks for Anita Urban, uh, the ECC receptionist. We thank you for Anita in the many ways that she has served here at Emmanuel. We pray your continued blessings upon her. We lift up Zion Lutheran School in Dallas, Texas, and uh, their ministry. We pray that you bless uh, all of their efforts. We, we pray for that community and that uh, Zion would be a, a light within that community that would share your love and, and, and strengthen the education in that area. We lift up to you Grace Lutheran in Denison, Texas, St. Mark Lutheran in Elko, Nevada. Lord, praying that uh, those congregations would be a light in those communities, serving the needs and sharing the good news and bringing your love to them. We continue to pray for Camp Lone Star and all the ways that they serve uh, the, the youth of this area. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them this week. Uh, and, and Lord, for, for all church camps, as we know there was much going on this week, and we pray for the health and safety of all those who participate. Lord, we lift up, continue to pray for Vicar Josh uh, as he prepares uh, to begin next week uh, in the office, and, and we look forward to his consecration service. And, and Lord, we ask you to bless he and his family in our congregation as we prepare to start that ministry together. Lord, we pray for these things and all the things in our hearts and minds in Jesus' name as we pray now together the prayer that Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. <laughs> Our first reading this morning is from Amos chapter 7. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, the Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from, the, from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go. Prophesy to my people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. Today's epistle is from Ephesians chapter 1. St. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, 
to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And please rise as you're able today for our gospel reading from Mark 6. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he's Elijah. And then others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his, brother's, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she, but he could, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard of him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and his military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in prison, and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to his mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. Are there any kids that would like to come join me for the children's message? Come on up. Good morning. How are you guys this morning? Good. Um, I brought something with me this morning and I just got it tied up. There we go. Does anybody have any idea what this is? It is a string. It kind of looks like a key. It's not a key. This is, yeah, well this is officially, yeah, like an eye hook. So it does screw it. But why would I tie this hook onto a string? Any ideas? To look like a fishing pole. Okay, it does kind of look like a fishing pole. Maybe if I put a worm on there. Or you know what I like to use, Callie? Hot dogs. Fish with a hot dog. It works, doesn't it, Hadley? Mm hmm. Yep, it works. This is called a plumb line. And this is probably not a super reliable plumb line because I made it myself and I don't really know that much about plumb lines. But how it works is it's a string with a weight on the bottom. And normally it would be like kind of a cone that comes to a point. Walmart didn't have any of those, but Walmart did have these eye hooks. So 
I made my own, and what this does is, do you guys know about gravity? It's what pulls us down, it's the force that like pulls everything down. So when gravity works on a plumb line, what it does is it finds the actual center of gravity, and then you can use the string to make sure that something is perfectly straight up and down. So you can make sure that it's standing up perfectly straight. In our Old Testament Bible reading this morning, the, in the book of Amos, God talks about using a plumb line, using something like this, to test the uprightness of his people. He says he set a plumb line to his people. And do you know what he found? They were not upright and true. See, he wasn't actually looking to make sure that they were standing up perfectly straight. God's plumb line is not a string with a weight on it. God's plumb line is his law, his rules, the things that he says that we should do as people created by him. So can you think of what some of those things might be? Okay, do not murder. Yeah, that's one of our Ten Commandments. What are some of the other things that we do because God designed us to do those? What are some of the other pieces of his law? It doesn't have to be like word for word the Ten Commandments because pretty much anything you guys tell me is going to fit into one of the commandments. How many gods do we worship? One, just one God, right? The true God. And God's people were worshiping other gods. Um, what else do we do because we're Christians, because we follow God? What are some other things we do? Okay, we follow his orders. We come to church. We worship. Do we do nice things for people? Yeah, out of Christian love, right? We're supposed to love our neighbors the way that we love ourselves. When God used his law as a plumb line against his people, he found that they were not following his laws very well. And do you know what else? If he used his law as a plumb line against us, would we be standing upright and true? No, because we're sinners too, right? And so God's plumb line, his law, his measurement would show that we are not standing up straight to the way that God created us to be. But the good news for us and what we heard about in our epistle reading is that because of Jesus, because Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins, when God holds up his measurement, Jesus steps in front of us a little bit. So when God measures us by his law, we, we don't pass. But when Jesus stands in front of us, then God's measurement is a measure of who Jesus was. Does Jesus pass? Yes. And so for us, even though we know that you and I are sinners and we would never pass the measure, we would never be standing upright and true to God's laws, Jesus died on the cross for us so that he could cover us up when God is measuring how we do with his laws. And so instead of God measuring the sinners that we are, he measures Jesus in his perfection who gave his life up for us and in his grace took our place so that we could get the promise of someone who is standing upright and true and living the way that God designed them to be, which is eternal life. So that's a huge blessing for us to even as we think about all the ways that we don't measure up to know that because of Jesus, we're going to measure up just fine. So let's fold our hands and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and taking our place on the cross so that we can measure up to God's expectations and have eternal life with you. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can head back to your seats.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, again, good to see everybody this morning, and uh, I hope you're having uh, a good summer. Uh, actually, let me ask that question. Show me by raising your hand. Are you, are you having a good summer? Some of you raised hands very quickly. Good. Actually, that's one of the best surveys we've done in a while. You guys popped up, and I've seen lots of your pictures online. If you're on Facebook or any of that kind of stuff, or your family, uh, lots of great pictures. People having lots of good stuff, and that's great, right? Um, that's what the summer's for, uh, at least in, in, in kind of the way we've, we do stuff. We've got summer breaks, and you've got vacations and all that. I guess mine is continuing as I forget microphones this morning. I don't know. Uh, but we all need those breaks, right? It's actually very important. I know it. Uh, maybe it feels for some, I know, for, I know for some that it's hard to take breaks, but it's good for us to take a break. Um, God designs that within, within the week structure, right? Sunday is supposed to be that Sabbath, that time for rest, to rest in him. Uh, it doesn't have to be on Sundays, but, but at some point to, to take that moment and break. Uh, studies have, have confirmed and, and affirmed that thought that uh, you get greater productivity out of, out of workers, out of yourself, if you take time to, to rest, to take a breather, and to, and to you know, let the mind and the body recharge. You can't keep going and going and going with, without it, it honestly harming yourself and others. So it's good to take a break. Uh, I myself finally took that short vacation, and uh, you know, I didn't have anything specific planned. I, I slept, I cooked. I read, I did do a little traveling here and there, if you, if you saw some of the things, and, and, and it was good to, to just rest and, and let, the, let the body recharge and relax and come back. Um, it's good, again, it's good to do that, and if, and if you don't, honestly, it, 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 it burns you out, right? And we've seen that in our lives, too, where we get sick, uh, and, and we just become less effective at those things we're doing. Uh, sometimes it's hard for us to take breaks because, truth is, we get a little arrogant. We may not think of it that way, but some people say, well, how are they going to get by at the office if I go? If I'm not doing, any, doing what's supposed to be done, and, and sometimes we think that way, right? How are they going to get by? And, and I'm going to share with you a difficult truth, a little tongue-in-cheek today, but they will get by without you. Pretty well, any employee that's ever left for whatever reason, ultimately, or stopped doing, the hard truth is that you're replaceable. And others will come along and be able to do the work you do. Now, that's not to put you down or you think, wow, Pastor, thanks a lot. And I don't need a rash of people quitting tomorrow. They don't have all the bosses mad at me, right? Um, but I, I, I want to take a thought to you or bring a thought to you and maybe take something away from you that it's not about you. We get very self-centered about everything that goes on in our lives and we start to think I am indispensable, that it's all about me. If I don't do this, nobody else will. And it prevents us from doing things like taking the breaks or, or that we need and, and other things like that. But I want to extend that thought this morning to our spiritual lives as well. We get so focused on, I have to do this, and I need to do this, and if I don't, nobody else will. And we work, and we work, and we work trying to, to do the right thing, perhaps, or get things done, and, and the pressure that we put on ourselves is immense. And it gets down to, a lot of those times, the thinking comes from feelings of control, we want to be in charge. We want to be in charge of our own destiny. If I don't take care of it, I'm not going to leave it to chance to anybody else. I, uh, I heard it this weekend. It was really remarkable uh, watching the weather. And I'm not doing this to make a climate change kind of spiel or anything. But the weatherman said, uh, as he talked about the high temperatures out west and said that this is a dark result of, you know, whatever about climate change. And it's up to us, up to you to make a change for that. And, and the height of human arrogance at that point, to think that we as individuals or even collectively can affect that is, is astonishing on a global scale. I'm not saying that we don't have responsibility, okay, to do things, but, but it's not about you. 
And in our spiritual lives, we have the same thing. You heard Amos today talking about the Lord prophesied, or he prophesied what the Lord said. He's setting that plumb line. And as that plumb line sets, and Katie explains beautifully, right, that the plumb line is the straight order by which we are supposed to do things. And Amos told the people, the Lord recognizes you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, and, and he's announcing his judgment, and he's going to leave. And we see how far off we are from the straight and the true that God has called us to. And I want to take a second and say that's good, first of all, that we see how far off we are. It is of vital importance, God tells us, to examine ourselves, to see that we are sinful. We must examine ourselves. That's why as we gather for worship, nearly every single time we examine ourselves to see our sin. And God tells us we need to see our sin. It's not just to make us feel bad, which there should be some effort or some, some sign of that remorse for the sin that we see in our lives. There should be something there, okay? And, and, and as we do that, it provokes a response to turn away from that sin, it's not just that we say our sin and say, okay, and yep, I'm a sinner, and then turn around and do it, keep doing it. God calls us to repentance. So we see the sin, we turn from it, we seek to do right, okay, at least I hope we do. Too often we, we shrug our shoulders and say, yeah, well, okay, that's it, and that's just how it is. But we see it, we turn from it, and God promises that we have forgiveness, but only in if and as we see the depth of the sin. Now, sometimes, though, our response is different because we see the sin, and rather than turn and receive that grace, we say, okay, I didn't do this, this, and this, and I'm going to fix it and make it right, and, and it's good to want to do the right thing. But we work, and we begin to work, and, re and we rely not on God's grace, but we rely on ourselves. And that's where the trouble comes in. Because then that gets to be us focusing on ourselves for making things right. And again, don't hear me say we shouldn't try to be doing right. We should be trying to do right. But we work and we work and we work. And the trouble is that as, as we continue to look at ourselves and measure our work, what do we see? You only see the sin. And it never is going to measure up. You cannot undo the wrong that you have done. You are never going to measure plum. You're never going to make all of the wrong that you have done right. You cannot. Sin, original sin has corrupted us, has tainted us. The sin that we have in our lives corrupts and taints us. Even our motivation to do right is corrupted because you're doing right just to save your own skin, right? I'm not doing right because I love the Lord and I want to do right just because. I'm doing right because more often than not, I'm afraid and I don't want the punishment that's coming. So who am I doing right for? I'm doing right for me. You can't do it. And this tireless working and working and working and working wears you out. But Ephesians tells us something else. Because God has declared you holy and righteous. And I, I hope you heard, this is an amazing passage of Scripture. Uh, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it. If, if not, circle it on your bulletin and go back look later. Uh, it's Ephesians chapter 1. Paul has his greetings in the ver first two verses. And then he, he sets into this litany, this list of blessings that God has given us. And keep in mind, God knows the sinful, broken person that you are and how messed up we are and how tired we are. And that's why he does this, right? So as much as you have just been brought low, likely because of this great job, pastor. Thanks for telling me how awful I am. Listen to what God did for you because you're so broken. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Now, I'm not going to read everything, but I'm going to read to you the, just the, the verb parts here that says what he did, okay? So, so God chose you for these blessings before anything was ever anything. He predestined you for adoption to be his child. He, uh, to the, for his glory, but because of his grace with which he has blessed you. In him you have redemption. By his grace, which he lavished upon you in his wisdom and insight. Think about that. God in his wisdom, even as you were sinful and broken, lavished you. And I love the verbs here. I love these adjectives. Uh, the lavish pouring out of his gifts set forth in Christ to unite all things in him in heaven and on earth in him again over and over notice who's doing the work he's doing the work in him you have obtained an inheritance with which you were the first to hope in Christ in him you heard the word of truth the gospel and believed and you were sealed with a promise in him you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of your trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Over and over, Paul lines out all that God has done for you. You didn't do a bit of it except mess up. You messed up over and over, and yet God in his love, in his mercy, in his grace, in his wisdom, his insight, there's just so much here to list. God pours out his mercy, grace, and love for you to give you a life. And the irony is, or the, the part that we can't get our heads around, it is in that, in that wisdom, mercy, grace, in us just believing in that, in the receiving of that, in the doing nothingness of it, you are made holy. All that you failed to do is undone. Christ is the one measured. Christ is the one who covers you. Christ is the one who gives you new life. And then all the good that God desires from you flows from you than the good that you've been called to do, but only as we focus our attention on Jesus. If we continue to focus on ourselves, we see the sin, we see the brokenness, and we fail to do it because we're doing it for us, but as our eyes are focused on Jesus, then the love that God desires flows from you because first and foremost, you hear that good news that you are holy and dearly loved because it's not about you. Because it's about Jesus. And as you have that new life, God wells up in you and the good works flow from you. So the invitation here is take a break. Stop trying so hard. I know that sounds weird. Stop trying so hard and focus on Jesus. Focus on the grace, the mercy, and the love that he has for you, rest, rest in that love of God in Christ that has given you new life. And, and then watch and be amazed at God's good works well up inside of you as you love your neighbor, as you serve one another, as you serve him in whatever capacity he has called you to. Rest in Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith in him in who we have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. And the peace of God then, which surpasses understanding, will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.